we all do it. We worry. Jesus comes to us today and says, do not worry. We're going to start a, a new series entitled Discovering Discipleship. And discipleship starts by acknowledging that God is the source of our security, that we are to trust in God above all things. And when we do that, then we can work hard, we can pray hard and accept all that comes from the hand of our Father, and we can be effective and productive disciples of Jesus. When we look to our Father's love and care for us, we end up drawing the logical and inevitable conclusion. Therefore, do not worry, as Jesus says. God, strengthen your trust in his care and love for you today. We begin our worship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. We confess. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin, for faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do, you should cast me away from your presence forever. O Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the well-being of people everywhere, that they may receive from you all they need to sustain body and life, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the spread of your life-giving gospel throughout the world, that all who are lost in sin may be brought to faith in you, hear our prayer, O Lord, Christ, have mercy, for patience and perseverance in this life, that we may not lose the hope of heaven as we await your return. Hear our prayer, O Lord, Lord, have mercy. Lord of life, live in us that we may live for you. Amen. Scripture tells us that one of the ways we combat anxiety or worry is that we are thankful. And so we sing the song, My Heart is Filled with Thankfulness. Sinfulness and call me in you. 
Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, you govern all things in heaven and on earth. In your mercy, hear our prayers and grant us your peace all the days of our life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first lesson is from Isaiah chapter 49. Isaiah foresaw a people who would have every reason to worry. Jerusalem was conquered, people and leaders exiled, the glory of Israel gone. But God's people could rejoice because he promised his comfort and peace. Listen to Isaiah 49. Shout for joy, you heavens. Rejoice, you earth. Burst into song, you mountains. For the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion on his afflicted ones. But Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. Your children hasten back, and those who laid you waste depart from you. Lift up your eyes and look around. All your children gather and come to you. As surely as I live, declares the Lord, you will wear them all as ornaments. You will put them on like a bride. Though you were ruined and made desolate and your land laid waste, now you will be too small for, for your people, and those who devoured you will be far away. This is the word of the Lord. Our psalm of the day is Psalm 37. David learned and teaches us not to fret because of the Lord's constant help and provision for us. Please join me in speaking this psalm responsively. Do not fret because of evil men or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass they will soon wither, like green plants they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. I was young and now I am old. Yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. Turn from evil and do good. Then you will dwell in the land forever. For the Lord loves the just and will not forsake his faithful ones. The salvation of the righteous comes from the Lord. He is their stronghold in time of trouble. We commit ourselves to you, O Lord. Your faithfulness endures forever. This is our psalm. Our second lesson is from Philippians chapter 4. Paul is addressing the Philippians and us about anxiousness. And he especially encourages us to take our worries to the Lord in prayer. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that once again you renewed your care for me. You were, in fact, concerned about me, but lacked the opportunity to show it. I don't say this out of need, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to have a little, and I know how to have a lot. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need. I am able to do all things through him who strengthens me. Still, you did well by sharing with me in my hardship. 
And you, Philippians, know that in the early days of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. For even in Thessalonica you sent gifts for my need several times. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the profit that is increasing to your account. But I have received everything in full, and I have an abundance. I am fully supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you provided, a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Our gospel is from Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 24. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do, your, why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. This is the gospel, the good news of our Lord. We'll join in singing, Be Still My Soul. Be still my soul, the Lord is on your side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Leave to your God to order and provide. In every change, He faithful will remain. Be still, my soul, your best, your heavenly friend. Through thorny ways leads to a joyful land. Be still, my soul, your God doth undertake to guide the future as he has the past. Your hope, your confidence, let nothing shake. All now mysterious shall be bright at last. Be still, my soul, the waves and winds still know. His voice who ruled them while he lived below. Be still, my soul, though dearest friends depart, and all is darkened in the 
smell of tears then you will better know his love his heart who comes to soothe your sorrows and your fears be still my soul your jesus can repay from his own fullness all he takes away be still my soul the hour is hastening on when we shall be forever with the lord when disappointment grief and fear are gone sorrow for god love's purest joys restored be still my soul when change and tears are past all safe and blessed we shall meet at last most of us have been tent camping tent camping in the woods. Even if you're not a tent camper, most of us have tried it at one point or another. And when you are in a tent at night and you're lying awake in the middle of the night, you'll sometimes hear a little rustling of the, the leaves nearby. You know very well that it might just be some small animal, maybe a little armadillo or, or some small rodent that that isn't going to mind that you're there. They, they don't care that you're there. They're not going to pay any attention to the fact that you are there. But in your mind, you hear that rustling of a leaf and you begin to say to yourself, maybe I should be afraid. Maybe I should worry. Maybe it is something bigger like a bear or a wolf or, or some other large animal that's going to, going to get me, going to, going to attack me. And so you begin to lose sleep all because you heard a little leaf rustling in the woods. In Leviticus chapter 26, God says that if his people forget him, if they don't acknowledge him, if they stop worshiping him, then he says, he says this, I will make their hearts so fearful in the land of their enemies that the sound of a wind-blown leaf will put them to flight. Worry from the, the smallest things is what comes to those who do not acknowledge God, who do not worship God, who turn away from God. Jesus puts it this way in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6, the gospel that we read earlier. In verse 32, he says, after talking about worry and, and saying not to worry, he says, the pagans run after all these things. Dear Christian, listen to this. Jesus says, worry is for unbelievers. Unbelievers, those who do not know God and do not know His Son Jesus, are the ones who live lives filled with worry. That's the pattern of their way of life, Jesus says. Jesus says that they're going to worry or, or fear loss of job or income. They fear not having food or clothing or shelter. They, they maybe fear losing their family and, and therefore their happiness. Now you might say to yourself, but Christians need these things too. Job and, and income and food and clothing and shelter. Christians and unbelievers alike are, have a great need for these things, to provide food for nourishment, to, to have clothing and shelter, to have 
families for joy and happiness. But the unbeliever's life, in the unbeliever's life, they think of these as the only things that count in life. And so they worry and they fret. In other words, these things have become the most treasured things in their life, the, most, the thing that they mo hold most dear. And so they, they worry and they fret and they run to and fro chasing after these things. If you look at the beginning of our text, beginning in verse 24, where Jesus says you cannot serve two masters, Jesus is really saying that worry then is a form of idolatry. It's a form of false worship. I heard a great definition of, for worry this past week. It really stuck with me and, and maybe it'll stick with you too. Worry is to give fear to something that God has not authorized us to fear. There are things in life all around us inviting us, tempting us to give them fear. We're afraid of sickness or disease or death or loss or pain. We're, we're afraid that maybe we won't make a difference in this life or we're afraid of something or someone in our past. And now think about this. Worry, without God, worry is reasonable and rational. If you don't know that you have a Father in Heaven who loves you and cares for you, who wants to provide for your daily needs and much, much more, then I guess it would be perfectly reasonable and rational to be afraid and to worry because then you're going at life alone. And you're chasing after all these things like food and clothing and shelter. You're going at it alone and that would be worrisome, wouldn't it? But for the Christian, well, for the Christian, it's like the story of the unjust steward in the Bible. A guy owes millions of dollars to his master. It's, a, it's an amount, a huge amount that he can't pay back. But his master graciously forgives his debt. Now, after being forgiven, this steward, this manager who had gotten himself into huge debt and just had it forgiven, the man goes out and finds someone who owes him just a small amount and demands that his debtor pay up. Now, I suppose that that would be fine to demand that your debtor pay up, except that this man had just been forgiven a huge debt. The forgiveness he received should have changed everything for him. My dear Christian brothers and sisters, worry may be reasonable and rational for the unbeliever, but when we take into account, when we step back and say, I have a God who created me, who loves me and cares for me. He daily gives me all that I need, sometimes just enough, but more often more than enough. And not only that, He has given me His own begotten Son, His beloved Son, into death for me. Will He not then give me all that I need for my daily life? Can I not trust Him that all the things that He gives me, even when they don't work out the way that I hoped or planned, that my Father in Heaven is sending only what I need and is in my best interest? It's interesting, Jesus contrasts worry with faith. If you are living a life with faith in God, as a Christian does, if you know that God created you and sustains you and gives you all that you need for your body and life, and that He's going to give you all that you need for the life to come, now worry gets thrown out. Worry becomes unreasonable for the Christian. And notice that Jesus doesn't say, a little worry is okay. Just worry about the big stuff. I'll take care of the little things. Or does Jesus say, you just sweat the small stuff. I'll take care of the big stuff. No, Jesus says over and over, do not worry. In fact, in our second lesson, the Apostle Paul says, do not be anxious about anything. 
God tells us that He's got everything in His hands, the big stuff and the small stuff. And that's the illustration with the flowers and the birds that Jesus is working towards. He's showing that, that He takes care of the small things and the big things. When you know that your God the Father in heaven is your provider, then you need not worry. Worry and faith don't go together. Worry is saying to God that we, we are going to have to make it on our own, that we're going at this life alone. Or, or maybe we don't say, well, I'm going at this life alone, but, but somehow we say that we can help God along, or we think that maybe God isn't totally in control. And Jesus responds in verse 27, Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to their life? Or another, another way of translating that, some believe it to be translated, a single cubit to your height. The Lord knows exactly how tall we should be. He knows exactly what is in our best interest. Working faithfully and diligently to provide food and clothing and shelter for ourselves and for others, this is, this is a good thing. But God doesn't want us to give ourselves over to worry and to fear those things. Because it leads to false worship. It leads to idolatry. These things are not the things that count the most in life. Much more important is what God provides for the soul. He says, not only will I provide all these small things, but I'll provide the biggest thing that you need, a robe of righteousness. Jesus clothes us in His righteousness. He gives to us His perfection. God covers over our rags of sin. He says, Seek ye first the heavenly things, my kingdom and my righteousness, and then all these things will be given to you as well. This life can be hectic. And we can be pulled in so many different directions and be troubled by so many different things. But when we start to worry, that's an indication that our sinful nature is fighting against our faith in God. Again, faith and worry are contrasted in the Bible. And so when we start to worry, that's our sinful nature indicating to us that, that it's trying to pull us to be afraid of something we are not authorized to be afraid of something that we shouldn't be afraid of. When God says in Scripture, fear me and trust me, He is intending to set us free from all of our worries and fears that would overwhelm us. He's not saying that there won't be things to worry about in this life. We, instead, He is saying live by faith. We live knowing that we are forgiven though we know our own sin very well. We look at our lives and we see our, our sin and we know it all too well, but faith says, though I see that I'm sinful, God's Word says to me, I'm forgiven. We might feel alone or wonder how this or that circumstance in our life could really truly be in our best interest, but then we know what God says. Faith clings to what God says, that He is with us at all times and that He is going to work all things for our good. We know that Jesus is returning on Judgment Day and He is going to stand in all of His glory and might and majesty and that might make us be afraid. But then again, faith clings to what God has told us. We are clothed in the robes of righteousness of Christ Himself we need not be afraid of the day we meet Jesus. Jesus is not saying that we are going to whistle through this life, through every trouble and problem in life, as if there's nothing to worry about, as if all problems and troubles are going to dissipate for the Christian. And so moms might be tempted to worry about their sons and daughters who are out with their friends, out late, Dads might be tempted to worry about jobs and, and how they're going to pay the bills and provide for their family. Sons and daughters might be tempted to worry about grades and being liked by their peers. These are typical things, aren't they? 
And so many hours of sleep can be lost and irritableness can rule our activities when worries fill our life. But in every case, whether things work out the way that we hoped or in some other way, God is telling us here that we can say confidently that these things need not control my life. We can say, my God is in heaven and He created this world. He is the creator of the heavens and the earth. And my God took on human flesh for me and died for me so that I can live with Him. He died for all of those sins that we have, where we have worried. When we have tried to cover up our worry by saying it's only concern. And so when the dollar bill or disease, or pain, or loss, or the grave itself come along and want me to worry, we respond, Christians respond, who are you to demand that I worry? I have Jesus and His righteousness and the promises of a God that are bigger than anything in this life. This is what Jesus means when he says, in this world you will have trouble. In other words, there will be things that tempt us to fear and worry in this life. But what does he say? Take heart, I have overcome the world. In other words, our lack of worry is not because of the absence of trouble. It's because our Heavenly Father, our Heavenly Father, is with us and has our best interest in mind. Our lack of worry is, is because God knows what is best for us and will help us to remain His children. Our lack of worry is ultimately because Jesus overcame the grave and He has promised we will too. And so when you are tempted to worry, meditate on the birds, Jesus says. You're worrying about the things of this life. Look at the birds. They don't have the ability to have jobs or, or storehouses or barns, but they don't wake up in the morning quaking with fear as to how they're going to make it through the day. No, they wake up in the morning and they praise God with their chirping. A God who gives them all that they need and sometimes more than enough. They aren't filled with worry and fear. You, dear children of God, clothed in Jesus' righteousness through faith in Christ, we live by faith. Faith praises God. And in our second lesson, Paul gave us advice as to what to do when, when, worries, when worries fill us, when anxieties fill us. He says, don't be anxious about anything, but with prayer, and petition, present your requests to God with thanksgiving. When we do begin to worry, that's an indicator that we need to take it to the Lord in prayer. And the peace of God, Paul went on to say, is going to then grow in us, settle in us. And why? Because there's one key phrase in there I think that's so important. With thanksgiving, bring your requests to God. When we begin to give thanks for all the things that God has given us, not the least of which is His Son, then the peace of God begins to settle in us. It dwells in us. It surpasses all understanding. This is what God wants us to do when we are tempted to worry, to fear. Fear things that He has not authorized us to fear. We empty ourselves of those fears and worries and anxieties by going to Him in prayer, by giving thanks to Him for all that He has given us. And then we have peace that surpasses all understanding. Amen. May the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll join together in confessing our faith with the words today of the Athanasian Creed. Many churches around the world are celebrating Holy Trinity Sunday today, and this creed is used on Holy Trinity Sunday. It especially confesses the faith 
in the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Please join with me. Whoever wishes to be saved must, above all else, hold to the true Christian faith. Whoever does not keep this faith pure in all points will certainly perish forever. Now this is the true Christian faith. We worship one God in three persons, and three persons in one God, without mixing the persons or dividing the divine being. For each person, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is distinct. But the deity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is one, equal in glory and co-eternal in majesty. What the Father is, so is the Son, and so is the Holy Spirit. What the Father, the Father is uncreated, the Son uncreated, the Holy Spirit uncreated. The Father is infinite, the Son infinite, the Holy Spirit infinite. The Father is eternal, the Son eternal, the Holy Spirit eternal. Yet they are not three who are eternal, but there is one who is eternal. Just as they are not three who are uncreated, nor three who are infinite, but there is one who is uncreated, and one who is infinite. In the same way, the Father is almighty, the Son is almighty, the Holy Spirit is almighty. Yet they are not three who are almighty, but there is one who is almighty. So the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, yet they are not three gods, but one God. So the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, and the Holy Spirit is Lord, yet they are not three lords, but one Lord. For just as Christian truth compels us to confess each person individually to be God and Lord, so the true Christian faith forbids us to speak of three gods or three lords. The Father is neither made nor created nor begotten of anyone. The Son is neither made nor created but is begotten of the Father alone. The Holy Spirit is neither made nor created nor begotten but proceeds from the Father and the Son. So there is one Father, not three fathers, one Son, not three sons, one Holy Spirit, not three Holy Spirits. And within this Trinity none comes before or after None is greater or inferior, but all three persons are co-equal and co-eternal. So that in every way, as stated before, all three persons are to be worshipped as one God, and one God worshipped as three persons. Whoever wishes to be saved must have this conviction of the Trinity. We continue by worshipping with our offering. On the first day of the week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with the gifts that God has given to us. You can give through text or through our website. Look for the Donate to Peace button on our website. You can also give by snail mail by sending in offering envelopes to the church office address on the screen. Our prayer of the church is for our communities and civil authorities. We pray. Lord God, you have graciously given us the companionship of friends and neighbors by placing us in communities where we may live in harmony and work together for the good of society. Keep us free from injustice, indifference, and prejudice. Lead us to seek the welfare of others and make us willing to contribute to the improvement of our neighborhoods, towns, and cities so that people of diverse cultures and differing talents may enjoy peace, justice, and good order. Bless our president, the members of Congress, and all officials who serve us in state, county, and local governments. Impress on all in authority the sacredness of the responsibility you have placed on them. Give them gifts required for leadership wisdom to make laws that will bring order and justice to our society and compassion for the downtrodden. Purge our land from dishonesty and corruption in government. Teach us to honor all civil authorities as your representatives. Through stable government, provide throughout our land an atmosphere where your church can do its work in peace. All these petitions and our private ones we bring before you in Jesus' name.
And we join in the prayer our Savior taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We'll close by singing Peace Prayer, a reminder that we pray for God to use us as his instruments in the world to bring his peace to others. Receive the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Just one quick announcement. The Women of Peace will be meeting online. Look for a link that will go out on Monday or Tuesday through email. Also, it will be posted on the Facebook page. You can join the meeting. There will be a Bible study and then a brief business meeting. You can also find other updates on our website and Facebook. Continue to check there. We'll continue to be worshiping at least for a few weeks in the Trinity Meeting Center. So please uh, check out the address there. If you haven't been there yet, the address is online. And you can join us there for worship on Sundays. God go with you until we meet again. Thank you.